He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48 verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Welcome back to the Lord of Spirits podcast. I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and my co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, is with me from Lafayette, Louisiana. So unlike most of our episodes, this one actually is pre-recorded. We're not live. Uh, because when this actually does air, I'm going to be participating in the Ancient Faith Ministries staff retreat. So if you were to call right now, you're not going to get anyone on the other end. Um, but we should be back again live in the future. In this episode, right now, yeah, we're ta- right now, we're talking to you from the past. <laughs> That's right. We're time traveling voices. It's like, a, it's like a message in a bottle <laughs> thrown into the airwaves. Right. So this message for <laughs> this episode is that we're going to be looking at the mysterious figure of Melchizedek. So Abram, who is going to be later called Abraham, meets him in Genesis chapter 14. Melchizedek gets mentioned again in Psalm 110, and then he shows up one more time in the Epistle to the Hebrews in its meditation on the priesthood. But, I mean, who is this guy, and and why does Hebrews link him to Christ? Is he some kind of pre-New Testament appearance of the Son of God? What's what's going on here, you know? So to get us started, we're going to focus on his appearance first in Genesis 14, but we're going to need a little bit of contextual backstory. So what's going on here, Father Stephen? What what happens right before Abram actually meets Melchizedek? Right. And and this isn't some arcane lore uh, or unearthed arcana. You can, you can find this uh, by reading the previous verses. Yes, right. But, <laughs> uh, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're like, okay, well, let's talk about Melchizedek. Well... So we look at, we do a search in Bible Gateway, right? Melchizedek. Oh, okay. So we read, we read Genesis 14 verses 18 through 20, which is where he appears and don't read what comes before that and what comes after that. Yeah. I mean, in Uh, this case, no archeological dig required. Just read your Bible. (laughs) Yes. You don't need to know Ugaritic. You don't need any of that. Um, But so, uh, before these verses, well, first maybe we should read these verses. Okay, yeah, let's <laughs> right. let's read those we'll verses the, just to remind we'll everybody. Do the uh, context. Yeah. Okay. So this is Genesis fourteen verses eighteen through twenty. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine because he was a priest for God Most High. So he blessed him, saying, "Blessed is Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand." Then he, that is Abram, gave to him a tithe of everything. And that's it. Yes, that is it. That's the end. And there are further conversations that Abram has right after this, but Melchizedek is just gone at that point. He just disappears. And he sort of comes out of nowhere and and disappears into nowhere. And... uh, St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews comments on this fact, but mm. we'll get to that later on. Right, right. Um, so uh, in terms of the context, we're, we'll start with what comes before this. Right. Right, because, of course, this this begins with a then, right? <laughs> so he's doing this. Melchizedek shows up with the bread and the wine for a reason. And so uh, what we have at the beginning of Genesis chapter 14 is a description of the War of the Five Kings, which sounds like 
something in Tolkien. I mean, could this be actually... described as a battle of five armies? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It's just no. two armies. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So, <laughs> well. and so um, what's set up is that sort of our, our main figure at this time is uh, this fellow, uh, Cheddar Leomer, uh, sometimes pronounced Cheddar Leomer uh, by kids in Sunday school uh, and then leading to cheese jokes. Uh, but uh, Ketter Leomer, uh, who is labeled here as an Elamite king, uh, is, his name uh, is from uh, Kedor and uh, Lehomer, which means servant of Lehomer, who is a, uh, an Elamite goddess. Hmm. Okay, so this fella is a pagan. Okay. But if you remember our last episode, uh, you know, Abram lives at the end of the Ur 3 period. The Elamites are expanding their territory at this time. Okay. And they're the ones who ultimately end the Ur 3 period when they capture Ur. Uh, but so. The Elamites are expanding, and what we're reading about in Genesis 14 is them expanding into Palestine, into Canaan, and its environs. Hmm. Uh, they're moving in that direction. And so uh, he and he has a number of uh, Elamite uh, kings who are vassals of his, whose uh, forces are with him as they're expanding and subjecting the city-states of that region uh, to vassalhood and to send tribute to the growing Elamite uh, territory uh, encounters resistance. Uh, several of these cities, uh, including Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, decide that they want to uh, resist uh, and throw off uh, the shackles of uh, Heder Leomer. Um, now, when we read about the expansion at the beginning of Genesis 14, the people who Cheder Leomer is taking out and displacing as he expands into Canaan uh, are a list of people who we should probably be familiar with already because we've co quoted Deuteronomy 2 a whole bunch of times mm. on this podcast. Uh, it's the Gergesites and the Hivites and, and uh, the Emim and the Amalekites, right? It's all the giant clans yeah. uh, that Keterleomer and his Elamite armies, remember these are Mesopotamians like Abraham, like Abram, are coming in and displacing them and taking their territory. So when Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain uh, decide they want to throw off and rebel against Keterleomer, they're siding with the Amorites and the other giant clans hmm. uh, against the uh, the Mesopotamians. And interestingly, uh, Genesis 14 names the uh, names Cheterleomer and his vassals who are on his side. It does not name the kings on the other side. So what's that all about? The, the five kings who attack them are just the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, hmm. the king of, <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I see, for uh, instance, in, 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 you know, Genesis 14, five, uh, this explicit reference to Ketaleomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaites, the Rephaim. You yeah. Know, and yeah. And the Zuzim and the Emmy. Yeah. So, I mean, this is literally a list of giant clans here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who he came and defeated. And then, but then when it gets to the kings, the five kings who are going to try to overthrow him, it's just the king of this city, the king of that city, the yeah. king of this other city. Yeah, verse eight. Uh, their names are unimportant, <laughs> right? Because um, they're, the, they're the bad guys. Um, in fact, the, the king of Sodom actually is going to, after the Melchizedek passage, have a conversation with Abram. And he's not named there either. He's yeah. just the king of Sodom. Right. The guy who happened to be king of Sodom at that point because he's not important. So remember, these are these are priest kings who probably set themselves up as god kings. Yeah. Which means so they're receiving in their cities, worship. Right. And and in the place where Abram is living, 
these people are considered divine beings and sort of immensely powerful and important. And the biblical text doesn't even bother to record their names. Yes. May their names be blotted <laughs> out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's not even there. Um, so when, when they rise up, they're essentially siding with those, those conquered giant clans, right? Because even now, even at this level in Genesis, just as we're going to see as the Torah continues, there are your run-of-the-mill pagans, and then there are giant clans, hmm. right? And, and pagans are people who have become deluded, who are now being held captive to these spiritual powers who they, they worshipped and who that gave them uh, power and control over them. Whereas the giant clans are the ones who are participating in sort of demonic sexual immorality, human sacrifice, cannibalism. Like they're the extreme end, right? And right. there's this distinction made sort of even here. Right. right. Uh, so your run of the mill Mesopotamian pagan is still better than a giant clan, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, he at least gets mentioned by name. Yeah. Yes. And, and he could be used by God to render judgment against those giant clans for their, for their actions. Right. Right. So, um, because he's on the right side, uh, Heder Leomer and his vassals, uh, wipe out, make pretty quick work of the five cities of the plain and their Kings and go and plunder them. And plundering doesn't just mean we take all their gold and silver and all their nice stuff. Uh, it also means we take a bunch of their people to be slaves. Yeah. And one of those people uh, who gets taken as a slave is Abram's nephew, Lot. Right, because he's hanging out in Zoar, which was one of the cities that got just got conquered. Right, right. And which is near Sodom, right? He's sort of, every time we see Lot, he's moved closer and closer to Sodom. <laughs> right? Until when Sodom is, and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed, he's actually living in town. Um but uh, so he's already in that area. So he gets taken to be a slave. So Abram uh, is not siding with the king of Sodom, right? He doesn't go into the battle in the first place, but he is going to rescue his nephew Lot, right? Who's a, who's a member of his family, uh, who's been taken captive uh, by, the, uh, by the Elamites. And so to do that, he goes and gathers together 318 fighting men. He's made some agreements with some people near the land he's living on. Those agreements would have been about who uses what water and how much for their crops and things. Remember, he's living outside of the city, outside of civilization. Uh, and he gathers together 318 fighting men uh, to go and pursue the Elamite armies to try to overtake them and get a hold of Lot and and set him free. Uh, if you are Orthodox and you have heard this story, yeah. it was probably at Vespers. Right, right. This probably shows before up. a feast of the Holy Fathers. Yeah, exactly. Like especially the feast of the first ecumenical council, but any of the ecumenical councils, you know, it's the point where the the reader stumbles over the name Keterleomer which sometimes have, has a G yeah. inserted into it somewhere, uh, you know. Between the, the A and the O, that's actually correct. Kotolo Gomor, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. Right. There's, a, there's an I in there. It's a long story. Right, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, my sense of the reason why that would be done, like, there's this kind of facile, I've heard this, you know, this facile explanation, which is, well, look, there's 318 people in this in this uh, little uh, rescue operation, and, and wow, there were, there were 300 18 uh, holy fathers at the first ecumenical council, you know, and I kind of wonder like, which I, is true. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Although I have to sufficient. wonder sometimes is like, is this a little bit of a chicken egg <laughs> issue? Like, do we say there were 318 because we're modeling it? <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it doesn't super, super duper matter. But um, the, the, the understanding that I would have is of the reason why this reading is chosen for um, the feast of these fathers is essentially to say that they're engaging in the same kinds of spiritual battles by virtue of what they're doing in those councils as was happening this specifically spiritual warfare because it's warfare against demonized, you know, cannibals and so forth, um, you know, giant clans. Um, it, is my take on that 
Is is that is that right? Right. It's it's the same kind of rescue operation. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, and and just like Lot isn't innocent, right? The the person who falls into heresy of the church isn't innocent in it, right? They're involved. Yeah. In following after the the heresy arc or following after the heresy, but from the perspective of the church, just like Lot got a little too close and now he's been taken captive uh, and needs to be rescued, that's what happens to people in the church with heresy. And mm. so what the fathers are doing is not trying to impose their power and impose their will, impose their views on the whole church, you know, through this act of force at the, at the councils, they're trying to rescue people who have been taken captive by mm. the doctrines of demons. Yeah. Right. And bring them back and set them free. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, I think the comparison that's going on there. Yeah. Um, cool. And yeah, the 318 thing is just a, you know, sub point, interesting sub point. Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've heard, you know, I, like I've read, you know, the people will say, okay, we don't really have a full list of all the bishops who were at the first ecumenical council. You know, the tradition is that it was 318. We don't really know how many were there. And, you know, I don't know, from my point of view, it doesn't really matter exactly how many were there whether there were exactly 318 and so wow what an amazing coincidence um or or whether we we assign that number because it connects back back to this lot rescue operation um to me it doesn't matter really you know either way it works yeah yeah this also this also should change our view of Abram a little bit. I think I think sometimes we've grown up with the kids' Bible story books, so we think he's just this kindly old man, right? You know, who who sort of lives in a tent with a bunch of sheep, and he's just this really the, like he just went to war <laughs> with right. the professional military of one of the great powers of his day, and won with like a ragtag militia he put together. Uh, so the, the first a team as it were, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so he, he's, he's, uh, and this is, you know, at, at, you know, age 80, you know, 85. Yeah. So yeah, Isaac um, hasn't come along yet. This is still before he's a, that, right. He's a force to be reckoned with. Um, so yeah, so that, that comes before. So it is after this victory and the recovery of Lot that uh, verse 18 says that Melchizedek, the king of Salem, shows up hmm. and, with the bread and the wine and gives this blessing. So then immediately after that, right, sort of the conclusion of the overarching story is uh, that when, when Abram did this, he not only recovered Lot, but he recovered a bunch of other people who were being taken as slaves, right, because they didn't have Lot separate. Right? where um and he also recovered a lot of stuff a lot of the gold and silver and other valuable stuff you know in the process uh and so the king of sodom shows up and says hey thanks for getting back my stuff i'll cut you in for part of it as sort of a bounty right finder's fee or a reward right, right? you gave I dropped my wallet in the Walmart parking lot. You found it. Hey, here's 20 bucks for being honest and returning it to me, right? <laughs> um, and Abram says, nope. <laughs> Abram says, I don't want any of your stuff. Right, right. Um, and, uh, and so we see already here foreshadowing, right, of this stuff from Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain this stuff that belongs to the giant clans, is it just sort of neutral stuff? Right. Right. You say right. it's just gold or silver or whatever. It's just objects, right? Melt it down, make something else out of it, right? Even if it's a gold idol, melt it down and make something else out of it. Yeah, right? I mean, we should, we should underline that this is a deeply weird thing to do in the ancient world. Yes. You, know? <laughs> you, you defeat somebody, you take their stuff. Like that is, like no one would ever <laughs> leave it aside. Like it's just, that would be a stupid stupid thing to do and it might even and might even threaten your survival like you you take the stuff that you win on a raid or in a battle or whatever because that's going to be useful for you why would you ever leave it right but here you have abram saying no this is all yours king of sodom take it 
Yeah, yeah. And he, he does say, you know, uh, during the during the trip, uh, some of his fighting men uh, had to eat something, and so they ate some of the stuff that they retrieved. Yeah, right. He right. said, that's sufficient. Whatever they ate, <laughs> that's our cut. Right, <laughs> right? that's verse 24, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so he, he wants none of it, right? And that's because these objects the material right has been tainted it is connected to so it's it's the same reason why you're going to see israel commanded not to take the plunder from the giant clans yeah right if if someone attacks israel according to the the laws of war in deuteronomy if someone attacks israel and israel defends itself and israel wins they can take those people's stuff <laughs> right? uh but not the giant clans Right. Not their stuff. Their stuff has to be destroyed. Right. And this is this um, again just underlines that Abram has been called out by God not to participate in the civilizations around him, and especially then not the giant clans, because they're yeah. the worst. Yeah. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah uh and the cities of the plain here end up shortly hereafter in Genesis being portrayed as worse than right. the giant clans. Yeah. The giant clans get to go on longer than they do. Yeah, God After takes this. out Sodom and Gomorrah directly. Yeah. So, yeah, so, and not very long after this. Um, so that's that's sort of the overarching context. So it's it's in, in the middle of this story that that uh, Melchizedek shows up. Right, and it's, uh, it's interesting if you look at the chapter, right, you get the story about the, the victory from the war and... and uh, you know they grab they grab hold of Lot. They rescue him. They make the trip back. They take they bring back all the stolen property, and then you know the end of the chapter is Abram having the conversation with the king of Sodom. And then suddenly, boom, verse seventeen. Um, I'm sorry, verse eighteen. Melchizedek just shows up. It seems like <laughs> so. It says the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram, and then and then Melchizedek just shows up with bread and wine. Like in the middle of this meeting, yeah. I mean that's that's how it looks, you know. As I'm reading this, like yeah, 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 yeah. and has this interaction with Abram, and then disappears, and then Abram goes, then sees the king of Sodom. So right. once again, he's gotten demoted as less important than someone else. Right, and it's interesting to look at just how this kind of works out in the text, like. If this is a kind of like like it's so uh, disconnected from the rest of the text, like there's nothing about those few verses, the Melchizedek verses, that seem to connect to anything else around them, right? Uh, at least on the face of it. Um, and so you know you might suggest, oh well, this is some kind of uh, you know interpolation or something like that. But it's like, well, this is badly done if it's an interpolation because it says, yeah. <laughs> and Abraham Abraham met the king of Sodom and the other kings. Oh, and then Melchizedek showed up. Okay, and then Abram had this conversation with the, the king of Sodom, you know. Like, it doesn't, it's not a really, it's, it doesn't make sense as an interpolation. Um, you right, know? yeah. You end up, you end up with the, the weird thing that you end up with with most modern source-critical method where you divide up the text and try and reproduce the editorial process, uh, where... Uh, you, you at once have someone who's a literary genius and a complete bumbler, like at the <laughs> right. same time. Right. Yeah. He whatever. Did, he whatever. Did all looks these worse. amazing things, amazing <laughs> literary things with the text, but like left all these seams showing. Yeah. <laughs> like he couldn't smooth them over at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and no one noticed <laughs> just, that after him. Yeah. Just really <laughs> right. obvious about everything he did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, what what. What then sort of is going on and what, what does connect this? Well, um, we're told right off the bat that, that Melchizedek, and there really should be, we're not used to it, but there really should be a hyphen in the middle of his name. Melchizedek. Uh, Melchi, Melchizedek, yeah. yeah. Um, TZ, yeah. Um, so we're told that he's the king of a city, right? So, so that's one connection. Because we've got a whole bunch of kings of cities here, right? <laughs> like, and, and he's the king of a city, so that's kind of a vague, vague connection, at least. Yeah, um, he's, Sa Salem is what it's usually given in uh, most English Bibles. He's the king of Salem, right? And and 
sometimes people want to try to turn Salem into Shalom and try and do he's the king of peace or something. Um, and you could you could do sort of allegorical things with that. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, originally, on the material level, this is referring to uh, a city that we're all familiar with from later in the Bible, mm. Jerusalem, <laughs> right? Um, because the city of Jerusalem, the name Jerusalem is derived from Ulu Shalim. Okay. Which so also has take, a hyphen in it. Yeah, take that apart for us. <laughs> so... Uh, Uru Shalim is the Akkadian uh, name for uh, for that city state, and it has two pieces. There's a hyphen in there. The first part is Uru, which you may recognize from like Ur and Uruk. That's a Sumerian word that has come over into Akkadian that means city or okay. settlement. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Shalim is a Canaanite god. Okay, so, so it's it is the, the city of Shalim. Yeah, the city or settlement of Shalim, right? Um, and that's why you get it referred to as just Salim or Shalim, right? Here, just just like in here in Pennsylvania, just like here in Pennsylvania, we have Pittsburgh. The burg part means you know a city or a fortified area, and William Pitt is the divinized god that is worshipped in Pittsburgh. No, probably not, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry. St. Petersburg might work better. Yeah, there but you anyway. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I just need a little inter-Pennsylvania cattiness since I'm on in yeah. eastern Pennsylvania, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and so that, that Uru uh, Sumerian word actually then makes its way through Akkadian, being loaned into Akkadian, makes its way into, this is just a... Uh, language nerd fun fact into Northwest Semitic dialects, which would be like Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Ugaritic, uh, as the word Yeru, which mm. means a foundation. Mm. Uh, it is used in the Bible to mean foundation. But um, so that's the city that he's the king of. Right. And his name uh, means the Melki. Melk is from Melek, right, which means king yeah. in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, the E there, the Melki, uh, the E is a uh, first person possessive. So it's my king. Okay. Melki is my king. Uh, and then Tzedek, right, is, is a word that means justice. But it's also the name of a god, who of could a have Canaanite guessed, god. Who, who could have guessed that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and so yeah. The, the for those maybe familiar with like uh, Arabic, for instance, there's Malik, right, which again means king. Um, and then even the the word Melkite um, <laughs> referenced people involved connected with the, the the imperium, you know, with the with the empire, right? So. So all these words yeah. are connected, um, you know. So when you look at that M Melki at the beginning of Melchizedek, that's that's this root. That's that that king root. So yeah. but it, yeah, my king, my king is Tzedek. Right, and so um, there there are there are ways to try to get around this referring to a pagan god. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that people try to do, but there are a bunch of problems with them. Uh, the biggest one is the name of the next king of Jerusalem who we see, which is in the book of Joshua, the next one who's named. And his name is Adoni Tzedek. Yeah, which would be Tzedek my lord is, my lord. is yeah. Tzedek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, which and suggests so there's, a, there's this cult of Tzedek there. And you know they he continues right. to be worshipped, right, right, right. And and Zedek is is the main god who's who's worshipped, particularly once you start getting into the Jebusite period at that city. Um. And so, uh, here's here's where we're going to have a conversation, <laughs> right? Because he's Us described as listeners. being a, a priest of God Most High. Yeah. Well, well. Before we get to that, yeah, right. we got to explain who Zedek is, right? Okay, and uh, 
we feel like our listeners are old enough now for us to have this talk. <laughs> Sit down and have this talk. Uh, this this is what I've been a little leery of because uh, it's not that someone might. Someone on the internet will take this and run in all kinds of weird directions with it um, and misinterpret it. But oh. uh, no, no press is bad press. I don't know. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but he, here we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. Okay. So, um, if you've read Religion of the Apostles or, or other things I've written, right, I, I've talked about how, uh, and we've talked about it on the show before, how uh, the the Israelites and, and Judeans of the Second Temple period already had the idea that their God was more than one person. Right. At least right. two. What we would what we would now call trinitarianism, right? A version of that or the beginnings of that or the form of that without that particular language yet. Right. Um so the reason they were able to have that kind of idea in the ancient world is that pretty much everyone in the ancient world had a similar idea. Not the same, but similar. There's continuities and discontinuities. Um, but in the ancient world, they believed that the, all the pagans, we'll just talk about pagans, the pagans believed that their any given gut pagan god could have a whole bunch of different bodies, right? a whole bunch of different localizations. Right, and, and this is where... I, I, this is something that we've we've occasionally gotten questions about. This is where the notion that the sun, moon, and the stars are bodies of gods—that's a pagan idea, right? right? Whereas the 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 you know the Israel idea about that is that they are two separate created things that the one takes care of the other, right? Right. That that, that right. angels are not stars, identical to stars, and stars are not the bodies of angels. That's a pagan notion, but that angels are assigned to take care of stars, and the association is so close that the scriptures have no problem kind of referring to stars as angels and angels as stars, but there's still this understanding that they are two separate things, whereas yeah. the pagan version is that these are bodies of gods. Right. 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 And so... Um, for example, you can have a sun god, right? And you believe that he is on top of a mountain somewhere in the council of the gods. And he's the actual sun in the sky. And he's in the local temple to the sun god inside the image, the idol there, right? And he's the king. Yeah, all right? at once. Those are all bodies of his, and he doesn't have to like leave one to use it. Right, like the sun doesn't disappear from the sky when you're doing a ritual at the sun temple. Right, meaning that the spirit isn't like hopping from one body to the next. Right, you know that they, they all exist at the same time, and the word that's used uniformly by scholars to talk about this is to say that any given localization of one of those gods, we, we also see this like with the Greek gods, like there's Zeus Boanerges, there's Zeus of a certain place, right? Or right. Baal of a certain place, right? And they'll be depicted looking very different, for example, right? Uh, the word for these different bodies and these different localizations is hypostases. What? Don't freak out. <laughs> no! <laughs> right? That's the word that's used. Yeah. So the idea that a given God could, ha could have multiple hypostases is a universal idea in the ancient world. Right. Now, did so pagans... So that's the point of continuity. Yeah. Did, did, yeah, as I say, did, but did pagans mean by that the same thing that we mean by it when we refer to right. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And the answer now, here's to that is... All the... Not exactly. <laughs> no. no. The answer is no. No. Yes. Okay. So that's the continuity. The continuity is the idea that one God can be the same God but have multiple hypostases right. at the same time that are all him or her, right? 
here's the discontinuity. Okay. There are a list of discontinuities, I should say. All right. So uh, in the pagan world, huge discontinuity. And, and you'll notice as we go through these that a lot of the Old Testament commandments about worship and a lot of the things that Yahweh, the God of Israel, says to his prophets are going to be trying to accentuate these differences, mm, yeah. right? Because the temptation is always going to be for the Israelites to think the way their neighbors and other ancient people do. Right. right. So here's the big first discontinuity. For the pagans, you can make a body for the god. Right. You could go and craft an idol. You could craft an image. You could perform the opening of the nostrils ritual or whatever parallel ritual is practiced in your place. And now that is a body of the god. It is now connected to it. Right. Not a thing. Now, the God of Israel says, no, no, you cannot do that. Yeah. And the, the, <laughs> right. thus, thus the constant references to he does not dwell in things made by hands. Right, right. Right. And he even has to then go beyond that, too. They're like, well, OK, well, we can't make an image and put him there, but maybe we can make a building and put him there. And that's why he has to keep telling them with the temple, I am not bound by your building. Right. <laughs> right? Like, we'll use it, but can't. I'm not in that. Yeah, I'm not bound right. by it anyway. Uh, the building itself is not an image of me. Um, so that's a major discontinuity. Right. 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 Uh, in the pagan idea, relatedly, those hypostases can come into existence and go out of existence. Hmm. They're not eternal. They're not eternal. Right? They're not eternal, and you can make them. So there's potentially infinite numbers of them. Right. Right? And potentially none at all. Right? Whereas Yahweh, the God of Israel, has revealed himself in three, only three, exactly three hypostases, which are eternal. Yeah. And you think about this from a kind of, I don't know, spiritual logistical point of view. Um, if you're a demon and you want to deceive mankind, you know, potentially infinite hypostases is the way to go. Because how many, how many opportunities would that be? You know, like, you know, I want to be everywhere. Uh, because that's what a demon kind of needs in order to be everywhere is numerous, numerous bodies that he can inhabit and interact with people through right it's so like it 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 makes sense not that i'm saying i know what it is to be a fallen angel i don't <laughs> uh i don't even know or what even it's a bat yeah or i don't even know what it's like to be the guy in the office next to my studio um he seems nice though but um <laughs> but 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 you know just at least what i imagine might be the case it seems you know good strategy to to have as no, as many idols and hypostases as possible for a demon so that he can connect on a local level with, with as many you know people that he can try to dupe as possible right right and and what once you understand this it makes sense of a whole bunch of things right so for example the golden calves in the old testament all of them right both when aaron makes the one and when Jeroboam makes the golden calves, right? It's not like, okay, I now made this idol. We're going to now worship this object. In both cases, they point at them and say, this is Yahweh. Right. Your God who brought you out of Egypt. Yeah. Right. So they're trying to craft a body. They're trying to craft a hypostasis for, for Yahweh, the God of Israel, to could find him and locate him. Right, which, I mean, without this understanding of this notion of hypostasis from the ancient world, that action looks just royally stupid. <laughs> like, wait, right. we were brought out by the God of all, you know, the Most High God, and and look, I made this, this, this you know, this golden calf. This is your God. Like, that, if you don't understand that that's what's going on, that just looks really stupid and you you know maybe one crazy person would have come up with that but why would all those israelites <laughs> then fall for it oh yes oh yeah right that's our god sure you know um and because it, it plugged into their to their pre-existing experience of what spiritual life is about and how you connect with a god right right and so uh that laid out so so 
to put a fine point on it, and I know this won't be the part anyone quotes, uh, <laughs> right? Yahweh, the God of Israel, has eternally existed as the Most High God in three hypostases, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's it. There's no more. They didn't come into being. They're not going to go out of being. That's it, right? That's in contrast to sort of the demonic parody of it, right? Which is infinite and changing and malleable and, and the pagan thing. So that established. Why did we go into that now of all times, <laughs> right? Uh, why did we risk everything? <laughs> to make... <laughs> To make the point that that this Zedek, right, this this God, is a hypostasis of Shemesh. Okay, okay so, so re remind us who Shemesh is, Father Stephen. Shemesh is isn't he the one that Samson be, is named after? Yes. Yes. <laughs> actually, actually, he is the pagan god who Samson was named after. Huh. Um, suspiciously, despite him having been promised as. Yahweh's chosen. Anyway, um, someone might make something out of that. Um, <laughs> but Shemesh, in addition to being the Northwest Semitic word for the sun, mm. is also the sun god. Okay. And there were there were a few other hypostases of Shemesh, but Sedek is one of the main ones. Um, and so you will sometimes find him referred to as just Sedek. Sometimes he's referred to as Shemek Zedekah, right? Where it's it's the, the tzedakah, that, that second word, is telling you the name of the, the hypostasis, like yeah. Zeus Boanerges. Right, right. Right. Um, that language, and this is a decide that we won't go into now, but may at some point in the future, uh, that Shemesh tzedakah language is picked up uh, by the prophets. That's the son of righteousness language that gets applied to, to mm. Yahweh, the God of Israel, and specifically to Christ. Uh, is actually a repurposing of of that pagan language, sort of in the same way that the Baal's cloud rider language uh, gets taken over and given to to right. Yahweh as the true the real cloud the true rider. most high God. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, this is this is a particular form. We've talked about about justice before, right? Justice is the the right relation between things. Right. And so the idea here is that this particular hypostasis of Shemesh is the sun as he establishes order upon upon the earth. Right. Thus, son um, of son of justice, son of righteousness. Right. 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 Um, and so uh, there, there's there's more about this. The fact that he's worshipped in in Jerusalem in the Old Testament when uh, when you look closely. Uh, so. We'll bring up again Deuteronomy 4, verse 19, that the sun and moon and stars were some of the divine beings to whom the nations were assigned hmm. uh, at Babel. Uh, but then more specifically, uh, 1 Kings 11, uh, verses 4 through 8, talks about Sol the judgment that comes against Solomon, David's son, for having built all these pagan shrines and set up all these pagan altars in and around Jerusalem. Uh, and there are a few details given, nothing specifically having to do with Shemesh. But uh, when you go to 2 Kings 23, verse 11, we get to the second righteous king of Judah. Hmm. There's not a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, and that's King Josiah, right. who is the other king. When, when you see the... Um, the traditional icon of uh, the Anastasis of the Resurrection, right? The harrowing of Hades. Um, on the one side, there's the prophets, and then on the other side, there's the kings. And uh, the kings you always have are David and Josiah. And then sometimes you see some other crowns in the background, or there's some kind of nondescript guys. Right. It's hard to find righteous kings in the Old Testament. Um, or in but Josiah general. Is <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There aren't a lot of Byzantine emperors who are saints. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that made Josiah so righteous is that he uh, went and destroyed 
all of those shrines, yeah. those pagan shrines that in and around Jerusalem, many of which had been there since the time of Solomon. Right, right. And so then the reference is given in Second Kings twenty three eleven. Uh, you know, speaking about Josiah, he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to Shemesh at the entrance of the temple of Yahweh by the chamber of Nathan Melech the chamberlain, which was in the temple precincts, and he burned the chariots of Shemesh with fire. So that's, you know, letting us know then <laughs> who these, you know, like, so we, we were told that Solomon set up these pagan shrines. And here's Josiah. It actually is identifying then who the shrines are to. It's Shemesh, who, you know, was this locally worshipped god. Uh, right, who had been the pagan god of that city. Right. So pe- people have asked about sort of uh, pagan creep, right? Like, <laughs> can, can these fallen powers, once they're ousted, kind of start creeping back in? Well, this is an example. Mm. Right. Right? David had taken the city from the Jebusites and purified it dedicated it to Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? Made the plan so that Solomon could build a temple there, right? So that that God would be on Mount Zion. That's the place where Yahweh, the God of Israel, chose to place his name. And, oh, here comes Shemesh sneaking back in. Yeah, this is actual syncretism, where you're worshiping multiple yeah. <laughs> beings. You know, that's this is not the same as the way that pagan imagery and stories and stuff get used by... Uh, ancient Israel and by the church in which there's not actually worship being offered to these other beings, but rather there's a sense that their story gets kind of included in, in the Christian story uh, in, in, in some way. You know, that's the difference. I mean, this to me is a really important point, actually, because uh, sometimes when people, when Christians talk about paganism a lot, or even, for instance, as I like to do, read pagan mythology, right? Uh, the accusation can be one of syncretism because you're suddenly you're including these stories and these these beings and so forth and what you're talking about what you're doing, but that is not the same thing as actually setting up shrines and altars to them and worshiping them. That's actual syncretism, right? It's it's one thing to say this these things fit into our story uh, in the following ways. It's another thing entirely to say. Uh, not only do they fit in their story, but here let's let's go ahead and offer a sacrifice to them. <laughs> let's let's go ahead and go into communion yeah. with them. That's not the same thing. Right, right, very different things. Right, and this is this is full on. Right, there are they have constructed. Right, so Shemesh, this is common iconography for all sun deities in the ancient world, pretty much. Uh, from Shemesh here in Canaan to Helios later, um, that, right, the sun god rides through the sky in this chariot. Yeah, right. Right, with horses. So based on what Josiah destroys, they had a full-on sculpted horses, constructed chariot, idol of Shemesh Mm. in the temple courts in Jerusalem. For so, hundreds of years. So many yikes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and now note, this is according to the Bible. I just want to make this point again. Uh, because people who are Old Testament scholars <laughs> who have devoted their life to studying this text will still do these kind of insane documentaries that I have to watch through a <laughs> bitter, terrible compulsion (laughs) where they will say, well, according to the Bible, Israel was monotheistic. So first of all, thank you for playing on that one. (laughs) But and then say, but we found in the archaeology all these pagan shrines and amulets and stuff. Ha, busted. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and it's like, well, if you actually read the Bible, the Bible said you would find all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so how how many how how long is it between Solomon and Josiah? Solomon setting these things up and then Josiah purifying them out. Uh, a couple hundred years. Yeah, man. Huh? Not. Yeah. Good. So this is most of Judah's history. Right. Right. That's there's there's active paganism going on in the temple. Um yeah, so this is this is uh, 
there isn't really a, the closest thing you get to a golden age is like the 40 years of David's reign. Right, right. So, okay. So, and, and even that, David has his problems, right? He does. Like, but fortunately, he repents. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yes. so all, all of this combined together, then you get a guy showing up, this, this priest king whose name means my king is Tzedek, this hypostasis of Shemesh, the sun god. And he rules over a city named Shalim, uh, Uru Shalim, you know, which is another uh, another pagan name. And then, you know, you later get these references to Shemesh being worshipped there in the courts of Yahweh's temple. Why is Melchizedek not a pagan god king priest? Like everything right. about him says that he should be, except for this line where it says. Uh, that he's not, <laughs> that he's a priest of the Most right. High God. <laughs> well, that's why he appears in three verses, and it says over to God Most High, God Most High, God, God Most High, he's a priest of God Most High. Right. Right, because anyone in the ancient world reading that first sentence, a guy named Melchizedek, <laughs> right, who's the king of Uru Shalim, that's a pagan, Right, he's he's just as pagan as Keter Leomer and everybody else. Right, right. right. Um, Literally every single ver- of these three verses, every single one has the phrase "Most High God" or "God Most High" in it. Every single one, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Over and over. So that's why they keep saying it over and over, because it's sort of like I know what you're thinking, but no, <laughs> right. I know. What you- now, of course, he didn't name himself. Right. Right, he would have been named by his father, right, whose heir he was, right, uh, and he didn't name the city, right. Um, city already had a name when he showed up and became king. Um, so what this is trying to tell us over and over again is that, like we saw with Abram in chapter twelve and his quote unquote call, which isn't really a call. Um, Melchizedek here is another one of those people. Apparently there's at least two, <laughs> right? And and presumably more out there in the world, even this far after the Tower of Babel, who are still worshiping the Most High God and not worshiping these, these lesser divine beings, right. these, these fallen demonic beings. Even though they've, he like Abram, He's living in a city and a culture, and Abram, even his father, right, in a family, likely, that are all involved in this this paganism, right? right? Who have all fallen into this kind of worship. Here's one more guy who has who has kept himself pure, and he comes out and he finds Abram. Right. Now, I mean, we should underline, there's no, there's no indication in the scripture that there are any nations or tribes who have retained the worship of Yahweh. We just have as these, a whole, right? Yeah, exactly. We just have these individuals that that yeah. that are mentioned, and I don't know, potentially and, families. Uh, I mean, certainly Abram's family becomes, you know, is that kind of family, at, you know, with him and his children and stuff. But, but yeah, there's no, because I mean, this is a question we sometimes get: like, did did all of the principalities who govern the nations really fall? And like, well, there's literally no indication that any of them didn't. You know, that's why God makes a new nation for Himself starting with with Abram. Right. Right. But there are these individuals. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and yeah, and just like with with Abram, you would assume in Ur, right? <laughs> You'd assume he's a bit, but he's not, right? Uh and the same thing with uh with Melchizedek, right? So uh what's the significance of that? Well, Abram has just won this battle, right? And it's really, as uh, as Abram is going to indicate, it's really Yahweh who won the battle for him, right? Because right. it's it's not just that Abram's a military genius, so him and his ragtag group <laughs> of 318 people could beat one of the most powerful armies in the world at the time, right? <laughs> and rescue him and take all this stuff, right? It, it's that, that Yahweh was on his side, right? And so... What you would expect to happen after that would be a thank offering. Hmm, right, right. To the God, right, Af- after the victory, which normally would involve, uh, like in the pagan context, you would have offered some of the tribute that was taken. 
right? So some of that wealth would have been in like flocks and herds and stuff. So you would have sacrificed some of that, depending on how pagan you were. Maybe some of the people, some of the slaves, some of the captured enemy military, right? As as human sacrifices. Um, but there would have been a sacrifice afterwards, right? Right? Because you you don't want to be ungrateful when you're worshiping pagan gods because they're pretty <laughs> fickle and they'll turn on you pretty fast, <laughs> right? Uh, right? Right? But so so, uh, Mel- Melchizedek comes out and finds Abram for this purpose, right? To offer the the thank offering, right? Which in this case is bread and wine. Uh, it's a uh, a thank offering, meaning it's a a Eucharist, as it were. Right, right. Um, but <laughs> the the uh, why why does he bring bread and wine? Well, remember, Abram wants nothing to do with any of the spoils. Hmm. The spoils are all tainted. That means you can't offer them to God either. Right. Right. He doesn't want them either. Right, but, um, that's but, what gets Saul into trouble later. Remember, that's excuse. He, he he seizes the Amalekites' livestock that he was supposed to kill, and he says, "Oh no, I was going to offer it as a sacrifice." <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, yeah, I was. No. Yeah. So, but but here's, <laughs> but here's the guy that Abram can actually worship with, because they worship right. the same God. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, when when Abram takes an oath in Genesis. 1422, so right after this, when he's talking to the, the king of Sodom, uh, and says, takes an oath that he's not taking any of the tribute, he says, uh, I have lifted my hand to Yahweh, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. Right? Which is, he's mimicking Melchizedek's language, hmm. who said, blessed is Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Right, right. I'm with that right. guy. <laughs> That's what he's saying. But adding, <laughs> yeah, and adding the name Yahweh. Mm, yeah. Just to make it clear, that's the most high God we're talking about. And that possessor of heaven and earth is not coincidental. Uh, that those territories don't really belong to those gods who are over them right now. Mm. Uh, that it's not he's that we're not saying oh yeah there's a whole bunch of gods but Yahweh's the best one or he's the toughest one <laughs> right he's the bestest one it's he's in a whole different category he possesses everything that is everything that is really belongs to him right which is not something that any pagans ever said about their gods that I can recall you know right they all and the authority their... the other ones have is delegated to them yeah right right even even what pagans themselves say about their gods is limited right it's it's right. there's there's not competing omnipotent gods no right. one else is saying that about their god right there's there's mine can beat up yours but there's not <laughs> right mine's mine beat, is yeah. omnipotent and created all the others yeah right from nothing right. and assigned them their places <laughs> right okay so so i wanted yeah. to i wanted to bring up this question that i know sometimes comes up with regards to melchizedek because of the the apparent, I mean, we've just explained why this is not the case, but by the apparent sort of sudden appearance in the middle of an irrelevant, you know, uh, uh, narrative, not actually true. But and and then the you know he sees this priest and he's offering bread and wine. Wow, that's Eucharistic. Some people say, oh, is 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 this Jesus? You know, is this is this the Son of God showing up? You know, in the guise of a priest king from the local city right um i thought it would be useful just to take a couple of minutes and, and say why the answer to that is no <laughs> um you know so certainly the angel of the lord right the angel of the lord or the word of the lord shows up a bunch of times in the old testament but there's all kinds of ways that that's talked about and ways that the text lets you know that that is yahweh the god of israel and none of that happens here with with melchizedek Right. Uh, for instance, you know, Abram does not offer sacrifice to this man. Right. That's usually that's one of the things that often happens when the word of the Lord shows up. Um, you know, there's not he's not called he's not called Yahweh. Right. He's not there's no language specifically identifying him as being God. 
um, you know, there's not, it's not a vision. There, you know, all of these ways that tend to indicate that someone is encountering the angel of the Lord are not happening in this case. There's no indication that this is anything but a human person who's, who's coming out and, you know, worships the same God as Abram and is the king of this nearby city. Uh, probably a pagan city, weirdly enough. And his family clearly was pagan, given his name. But somehow he worships the one true God. We don't know why. Like, there's no, there's no context for why he is a worshiper of Yahweh. We, we just simply do not know. Um, but there's also no indication in the text that this is the angel of the Lord. Like, all the, the markers that you would normally look for, none of those are, are here. Right, right. And... and uh... Two chapters before, Yahweh just talks to Abram. And he says, I will bless you. I bless you. And I will do this. First person. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why Not would Melchizedek third person? Why would Melchizedek say, yeah. you know, you're blessed by my other hypostasis? Like that doesn't yeah. make any and, <laughs> sense if that's what's going on. And, there. Right. And and the chapter after this, Yahweh comes with two angels and he eats with him. Right. At the Oak of Mamre, right? So there's there's a pattern here that this is in the middle of it. It doesn't match that pattern, right? Right. right? So this is a different. That this is a person, and and as you mentioned, he doesn't sacrifice to him. He does tithe to him. Yes. Right. But that's something you do to a priest who's a representative, right? That's not offering a sacrifice, right? Right. And he he tithes from his own. And again, that's a part of a thank offering. Um. Yeah. Giving thanks to God through through the uh, the priest who yeah. is acting as an icon or an image, as we've talked about right. before. Right. Okay. So before we take a break uh, at the end of our our first half here, um, there's a few things in this scene that actually kind of set up some other big issues for the future in Scripture. Uh, why don't we just kind of quickly go over them? Yeah. Well, we get. We get a little bit of the very first seeds of what we call talked about as remnant theology in the episode on Saint John the Forerunner. Right. Uh, this idea that starting that that really starts with the prophet Elijah, but you get the seeds of it here. That even though in this case in Genesis, a few chapters before this at the Tower of Babel, God has sort of dis- had to distance himself from sinful humanity, that he hasn't abandoned humanity. Right. Right. And it's not just Abram. Right? right. There's also Melchizedek. So there are these people who are still faithful. Yeah. There's there's this Yahweh, faithful the most high God. Yeah. Scattered here and there. And they may not know that they all exist. Right. <laughs> but they're out there uh, who are still faithful. Um, we also get from this whole story, this pattern of doing battle with the giant clans, with the spiritual evil and then victory, and then the emergence of a king to offer sacrifice. So that pattern is going to play out sort of throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament hmm. uh, in ways you could probably immediately see. Um, and we see uh, within uh, the figure of Melchizedek, someone who is not a pagan, who is uniting the roles of king and priest in his person. Hmm. And so he's going to become sort of archetypal for the, you know, the Venn diagram overlap of king and priest uh, theologically uh, in the Old Testament. Right, right. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a break, and we will be right back with more. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855 237 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. Hi, this is John Maddox. You know, when you support Ancient Faith Radio, you're not only helping to make this ministry possible for you, but also for people like Bryce in Australia. I'd firstly just like to say that I love your show and what you do, it means a lot to all of us listening. I'm down in Australia, and over here, orthodoxy is basically unheard of. I'm not orthodox. I was raised into an evangelical Protestant family. However, from a gradual exposure and desire to learn more about orthodoxy, I've come to agree and see truth in pretty much everything the church teaches. The nearest English-speaking orthodox church is several hours away, and I feel all alone in my pursuit of the faith here. 
Currently, my only exposure to orthodoxy is through Ancient Faith Radio and my friend. How should I introduce the idea that I may be inquiring into orthodoxy to my parents? Thanks again, Bryce. Would you consider a donation to AFR right now? You can do so on our app or go to our website at ancientfaith.com support. Ancient Faith Radio, here for you and for people all over the world. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome back. This is the second half of the show. Now, normally we would start taking your calls here, but... Despite what the voice of Steve just said, this is a pre-recorded episode, so we're not going to be receiving any calls for this one. If you call the number, no one's going to be home. I so. can I could do a funny voice and ask you easy <laughs> questions. <laughs> That'd be fun. Hello, hello from Lafayette. You do a whole, <laughs> whole <laughs> Phil Hendry thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could just grab someone from the hall here in the, the Tower of Podcasting and see what they have to say. Uh, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, well, we just finished up talking about Melchizedek's appearance in uh, Genesis 14. And um, now we want to actually connect to one of the themes that we talked about in the last episode where we talked about Abraham, but then we also talked about Isaac in particular and how Isaac is this singular seed this unique son of abraham and then as you know as we mentioned so you know go go listen to that episode first if you haven't listened to it yet okay um as as we mentioned welcome back yeah yeah welcome back everybody (laughs) from doing that thank you um (laughs) um and and uh that the christ is that seed he is the seed you know the unique son right of the father who is the one who fulfills all these things so so yeah so we're going to connect actually this you know this question of who is melchizedek with that so pretty cool um (laughs) (laughs) wait what actually yes so all right help us out here father because that's probably not obvious to most people (laughs) not to me for sure right so well we we um we talked about how Melchizedek becomes uh, where we left off in uh, the first half, uh, how he becomes sort of the, the co-location theologically in the Old Testament of king and priest. Right. Uh, right. And we, we talked, as you mentioned last time, about this idea that in addition to seed plural and this multiplication language that's used in the promises to Abraham, there's also the promise of this unique singular seed, this unique singular son. Uh, and, uh, as anybody with even sort of a passing familiarity with the Bible and, or Christianity or even Judaism probably knows that idea of a single descendant of Abraham, who's sort of unique and special becomes sort of alloyed with the idea of kingship Hmm. in the form of the Messiah, right? Mashiach, the anointed one or Christos, the anointed one in Greek, um, and so really what we're going to be talking about this second half is sort of how that happens, hmm. right? Um, so we see this image here early on in the story of Abram of a faithful king uh, who is also a faithful priest, that there is one somewhere, right? <laughs> that's, that's a thing that exists. Um, and that's the first image of that that we get in the scriptures is Melchizedek. Hmm. Um, he's the first king who gets any kind of, overall positive mention. Um, and so now how does that kingship get connected to this, this singular person? And we, we talked about last time how and St. Paul makes this point in Romans nine, that, that you see the singleness uh, first reflected in the line of Abraham, that there is a, an individual line that is going to lead to this ultimate seat. So it's, it's Isaac and not Ishmael who's in that line. Right. And that's why, as we talked about last time, Isaac becomes sort of the icon for that ultimate chosen unique son. But then it also goes to the next generation, right? It's Jacob, not Esau, right? As St. Paul points out, but it then continues after that, 
right? And after you get through Jacob or Israel, you now have 12 kids with four different women. Um, (laughs) Where it it spreads out even more. And these become fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, And so when the time comes that uh, Jacob or Israel is dying, uh, he's on his deathbed, he gives what is now called his testament. Uh, this is the use of testament that's in last will and testament. But mm. this actually, we, we find this several times in the Old Testament where someone will be dying and they will sort of give final words to their their children or other descendants. And uh, often those have a prophetic nature. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's, it's blessings and stuff too, but, but right. not always. Yeah, that there's this there's this sort of wisdom imparted right, of patterns and and what's going to happen and who they're going to be and what's going to happen. Um, And there is, within Second Temple Judaism, a vast array of uh, apocryphal, uh, non-canonical testaments of different figures. Yeah. Testament of Abraham, Testament of Isaac. Testament testament of the the 12 patriarchs, right? Right, right. Testament of the 12 patriarchs is a very key and important one that people should read. But (laughs) because that actually gets referenced and possibly even quoted at one point in the New Testament. Mm. Um, And uh, and our uh, manuscripts for it are from Mount Athos. Uh, Hey, but um, (laughs) that's where it was preserved, not in uh, Jewish circles. Um, But so within this particular one that we find in in Genesis chapter 49, which is the second to the last chapter of Genesis, uh, Jacob or Israel is giving his testimonies. And some of some of them are kind of harsh, you know, like Benjamin and uh, Dan in particular get basically told they're the devil uh, (laughs) by their dad as he's dying. Uh, But that's talking about things that are going to happen in the future. Harsh. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Like, really? (laughs) Wow. Could these are skip me. These are your yeah. last words. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I never uh, liked you. No. <laughs> yeah. And and we talked about how uh, firstborn <laughs> status is not necessarily the same thing as being the firstborn right child. Right. Right. So uh, uh, Jacob slash Israel's firstborn son is Reuben mm. with Leah. Uh, Reuben was not good. Yeah, I mean, uh, wasn't he was the, he was the ringleader that that got rid of Joseph, right? Yes, <laughs> and yeah. he also s- slept with one of his father's concubines to try to take control of the family. Yeah, um, as one apparently does, <laughs> should not do. Yes, yeah, um, not. that's one of the episodes of that in the Old Testament out of several. Um, and he's just and and he and Simeon, who's the second son, also masterminded the whole "let's go murder all the men of Shechem for violating our sister" uh, episode um, in in disobedience to his father. So the, the, Reuben and Simeon get left out. Levi's next. Uh, Levi has his own special destiny. We know with the priesthood. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so that brings us to number four. Uh, note, by the way, number four, uh, son of Leah. Hmm. Yeah. Judah. Judah is one of the sons of Leah, not of Rachel. Right. Um, not the the sort of favored wife. Uh, right. right. So th- things take interesting turns. Um, and so he gets to Judah and offers this blessing to Judah that becomes critically important for what comes to be called the Messianic tradition and the rest of the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay. So well, let's read it. So this is Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cu- cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. 
which I mean, you know, I, I'm just imagining hearing this be the last thing my dad says to me. I'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> like, he's sort of like, I don't see how this applies, but I, I like the scepter stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that, uh, but I don't really yeah. know about the rest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. Um, and this despite Judah himself not being perfect. Right, see no. Tamar. Um, but um, so, yeah, so, so uh, now I, a note on how you read it, right? Um, so you, you read this, the scepter bit, right? Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. Okay. Um, that is by all accounts what the text says. Now, when I say by all accounts, okay, so the oldest Hebrew of Genesis we have, of course, uh, which comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, does not have vowels note, vowels notated. Right. Right. Um, Semitic languages are generally written without vowels. Uh, and how things are vocalized, meaning what vowels you pronounce them with, can change how things read. Right. Right. I mean, you know, in English, the word net, words net, knit, and not all have the same consonants, but boy, that right. vowel makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah. Better, batter, butter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Bitter. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, so um, when you're, when you're translating from a Hebrew text that has no vowels into another language, you, you have to make certain choices, right? And, and those choices you make will reflect a certain understanding of the text. So the way the translators of the Septuagint, the Greek translators, the way the Aramaic translators who translated the Aramaic Targums, and the way the Syriac translators who translated the later Aramaic, the Syriac, read that verse was the way you just read it. That the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs, until the person to whom it belongs arrives, right? Um, suspiciously, <laughs> right? Uh, when you look at the medieval Masoretic text, which is if you go and buy a, a Hebrew Bible, a Hebrew Old Testament today, that's what you will get, right? And the reason it's called the Masoretic text is that they've taken the Hebrew text, which is that Hebrew text, the Hebrew itself, is identical, literally identical to the Hebrew we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in terms of the written letters, okay? But it's called the Masoretic Text because these fellows, the Masoretes, that's who it's named after, uh, were scribes. They went in and put in vowel pointing. Right. They put in marks to indicate the correct vowels, and they put in these marginalia, these two sets of the Masura, these two sets of marginal notes um, about the text, right? So they preserved the text exactly as they found it, but then they annotated it right? Uh, for how they thought it should be interpreted. And interestingly, by uh, 1000 AD, uh, until he comes to whom it belongs becomes until he comes to Shiloh. Hmm. Uh, there's no explanation as to what that would mean. Right. Right, because, I mean, even even they, even rabbinic uh, Jewish communities of the 11th century AD would say, well, yeah, this was talking about the Davidic king. Right? So, yeah. Right, right. So that dog don't hunt. So that's why we read it the way you read it. <laughs> right. Even though if you pick up a given English Bible, some of them will have some of them will have this and have the Shiloh thing in a footnote. Some of them will have the Shiloh thing and this in a footnote. Yeah. Um, they pretty much all preserve it in a footnote because it's kind of obvious what's going on here, right? That this promise of a specific messianic king has been edited out by the rabbinic Jewish scholars, right? Um, but be that as it may. But so what we see here is that we see this 
this kingship language with the scepter, right, that is applied to Judah and his descendants, but then specifically that there's going to be, because the scepter is going to be there and the ruler's staff is going to be there in Judah, there's going to be a line of kings that is going to culminate in a singular king, right? Um, there is going to be, uh, uh, it's not just, this is prophesying that David's going to show up. Right, that doesn't work because it says it won't depart, right? And and David is the first king from the tribe of Judah, right? Not the last, right? Um, and there are promises made to his line that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So here we have this idea of this singular seed we've been tracking from Isaac to Jacob, and now it's going to go to Judah, and now we have this element of monarchy and and kingship being being brought in. Right, right. And you even have this language of first your father's sh sons shall bow down before you. Right? That's the first part, right? Which, your that, father's sons, the tribes. Yeah, which kind of, you know, also you know suggests an elimination of them from this this line of the seed. Right. You know, right. 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 So so this is said is going to be the king of Israel first, but then right his hands shall be on the neck of the enemies. He's the one who's going to defeat those enemies. Remember, that was part of the promise to Abraham originally. They would camp in the gates of their enemies. Yeah, right, right. Which means you've really so, got their city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and having your hand on their neck is pretty much, <laughs> right. you get the idea, right? right, right. <laughs> like, you win. Um, right, so so you have that kingship idea. Now, elements of this get, picked, get picked up. We, we talked briefly... Uh, in uh, our uh, Christmas slash astrology episode um, about the fact that in this text, in this testament, there's this animal imagery associated with, with each of the tribes, and that's not unrelated to certain constellations, right? right. We have this lion language with Judah. With Judah, yeah. Uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, there is actually Orthodox iconography, depicting uh christ as a child mm, right. uh, usually laying on a mat which then will quote this uh, uh thing about judah being a lion's cub right right yeah <laughs> right. yeah that icon is who called, is crouched yeah it, that icon is called anapeson which i think is just the greek word for that sort of lying down um yeah yeah you often see this um on the back wall sometimes of churches or of narthexes um uh, that's one place that you, that I've seen it in a number of churches. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And so there's, there's this rule over Israel culminates in somebody who's going to rule over then over all the nations through the defeat of the enemies. Uh, and, and this person is then who comes to be called the Mashiach, the anointed one, the Messiah. This is that the promised seed, the promised son, the unique son is going to be a king. Mm. And, Christ himself, of course. Well, this gets further elaborated. It gets picked up again in Zechariah 9, verse 9, uh, which is an explicitly sort of messianic passage talking about the Messiah coming, uh, riding on a on a donkey's foal. Yeah, so it's the Palm Sunday prophecy, as we would... But, but, right. here, it is, but here it is again in Genesis 49. Yeah. Right. right. Zechariah is picking up on this imagery, right, to say he's coming. Right. Don't forget about this. It's been a long time. Uh, it had been uh, probably a good 1300 years by that point. Uh, that's, but, uh, don't forget about it. And then that Zechariah passage, sort of this comes through that Zechariah passage into the story of Christ's triumphal entry in Jerusalem in Matthew 21, verse 2, Mark right. 11, verse 4. Remember, when he tells them to go and find the donkey, he says it's going to be tied to a vine mm. right so he, he's christ is is explicitly identifying himself as yeah. this figure by doing by acting this out right and that's why it's totally clear to the crowds on that day that that's what he's saying right right and that's why they're all yelling hosanna to the son of david because they don't hey this, uh, messiah right <laughs> he's doing messiah stuff um Right, so that all that gets drawn in here, and 
so we mentioned this very briefly in the past um in in uh, our episode about the theotokos uh the queen stood on his right hand but uh We'll, we'll we'll talk about it a little again here in terms of the Davidic monarchy, right? Which is then connected to this. Uh, we talked about there how the Davidic monarchy serves as kind of this icon, then. Right, right, right. Or a as the language we used in our last episode is sort of the sign, hmm. yeah. right? The coming of the first king from the line of Judah is then a sign of the ultimate king who's going to come, right? The beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy that's made to Judah. Um, and we talked about that time how there's this misunderstanding uh, because of our Puritan ancestors uh, in this country. Um, and by that, I mean the United States. We have listeners all across the globe. Hello, New uh, Zealand. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in, in the United States, at least, our ancestors are a bunch of Puritans who got, got thrown out of Europe for being heretics. Um, our, our cultural ancestors. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Some yes. of us are not literally um, descended. I mean, I'm sure probably I am no. on some level, but yeah. I'm literally descended from some of the people who threw them out. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, hey, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, we, we've read, we've tended to read uh, what goes on in First Samuel uh, or First Kingdoms chapter 8, this whole thing where Israel demands a king. We've been taught to read that as kings are bad. See, the Bible says right. kings are bad. Right. Right. Yeah. God doesn't want kings. Israel wants. A, Israel wants a king. God says no. Like yes, of course, monarchy is bad. Right. right. And, I mean, and right. I have to. And, and I have to admit that that I myself have actually made that argument uh, while I was yet ignorant. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and it's interesting that even though so many of us imbibed that as children in Sunday school and sort of culturally imbibe that like it never crossed our mind. Well, wait, how does that work with the whole Messiah thing? Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, the the problem, (laughs) the problem isn't kingship. It's the wrong king and, and or the wrong kind of king. Right. A deformed type of kingship. Yeah. Right. Um, Right. So, so yeah. So in Deuteronomy 17, there are the commandments. Right as we talked about before, where God says, "When you get into the land and you have a king, <laughs> right? Here's right. the do's and don'ts." Right. right. So basically, saying, "Look, God knew that there was going to be a king, and so here's the commandment." He didn't say, "You're going to get into the promised land. You're going to want a king. You better not do that ever, because you're not yeah. supposed to have a king." He he gives commandments related to kingship. Right. Right. We're keeping this a theocracy, people. No, there was none of this. <laughs> um, so. Uh, and and even you know, uh, let's make the obvious point. Uh, at the beginning of the book of Samuel, uh, when they ask for a king, Samuel's the judge of Israel, right? Right. He, he's the one who's ruling over and judging Israel, and, and is the prophet. And the text says he's training his in verses nineteen twenty. He's training his son to take over. Hmm. When you have one person in charge, and that passes on to his son, yeah, right. I mean, what, what do you call that? Yeah, that's basically <laughs> primogeniture monarchy. Yes, right? right. So, the situation of a monarchy is not that different, right? That than the situation with Samuel, right? In that respect, right? In, in, in that sort of just detailed respect so so what is the difference and what is the problem there right since since um deuteronomy 17 uh yeah uh, well, says there's going to be a king and and he even says in deuteronomy 17 uh he, he's not just talking about david and, and the davidic king because in, in verses 18 through 20 of that the positive command that Yahweh, God of Israel, gives for the king is that the king is to make his own copy of the Torah, to study it and learn it, so that the king's dynasties, plural, may be successful and may be blessed. Right. So he's right. setting it up in, in view of a long-term a, a, a whole set of things, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In those, yeah. In those commandments. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, not, you know, what makes the, the, the uh, desire for Saul... 
different from God's vision that he's, he's imparting to them is they want a king who's going to act like the kings in their area. Like they right. see that. They see a king who, who conquers, right? That's what they want. They want a conquering king, uh, you know, a, a human person to be their conquering king. But that's not what the kind of kingship that God had described to them. Right. And, and in, in uh, 1 Samuel 8, verses 19 and 20, they, they use that language of, we want a king to lead us out and bring us in. Yeah, that's and about, you know, that's military. War. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Lead us out to war and then bring us back. That's what we want. Right. And, 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 so, and I was going to say, I, I think it's a, yeah. as, as an interesting side comment on this, right? I mean, within, like within modern Orthodox circles, there is sometimes a debate about monarchy amongst some people and some really kind of uh, lionize it. See what I did there. Um, and, um, you know, kind of a thing in and of itself, but it's interesting that often the image that they have is exactly this image of monarchy, you know, the conqueror, right? This military, you know, hero, right? Uh, whereas God's image of monarchy is, is Christ ultimately, right? He's the image of what the King is supposed to be. Um, yeah, it's 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 fascinating to me, you know, that um, you know people can say, well, look, the kingdom of heaven is ruled by a king, and then they can kind of conclude from that 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 means any kind of kingship must be the right way, but but no, actually, you know, lots of kings were clearly unfaithful and get judged by God for their unfaithfulness, and you know, it's because the kind of kingship that they practiced was not the sort that God was talking about when He was talking about kingship. All right, so. Uh, let me just say, since in Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 20, the primary job there of the king is to, to copy and study the Torah. Mm. Uh, it really means that biblical scholars should be king. <laughs> so, so not, when pl- my not administration Plato's philosopher starts, kings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When my administration starts, <laughs> uh, which should be any day now once people realize the truth, uh, all those of you who have been kind to me will have favored positions. When you come into uh, your kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm somehow dubious that that will actually happen. <laughs> um, but, but so, yeah, so, so the, the, the problem here, the rejection of Yahweh, the God of Israel here, is not that they want a human government with a single head, right? Who is a representative of Yahweh on earth, because that's what they had before with Samuel. Right. It's that they're no longer, as they were called upon to do throughout the end of the Torah and Joshua and Judges, to they're not willing to have Yahweh lead them into battle and fight the battle for them and win the spoils and bring them back. Right, because... They want to do it under their own power with a strong yeah. king to lead them. Yeah, be- because because prior to this, at some points, right, right. he literally <laughs> was leading them into battle. Not just yes. sort of like inspiring them, like, oh, I really feel like God is with us today. Like, like they, they saw him fighting in the battle. He was literally yes. leading them. And so, I mean, what they're it, asking for is to replace him. They want to replace that, right. that, that uh, role that God was, was, was had. Yeah. And you say, why would why would they do that? Well, because sometimes when they were unfaithful and sinful, as happened throughout the book of Judges, they lost. Right. Yeah. And he, he left them, you know. At, at right. And, and they don't like them having to be responsible to God. Right. <laughs> they don't want to have to, to to the you know, to 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 keep the the covenant to to have God fight for them and, and to bring them victory. They just want to have a man do it who's accountable to them, mm. right? Because, of course, once you have a human king, if you don't like him, you can just ax him, literally, <laughs> and uh, bring in a new one. Just ask the Puritans. Um, <laughs> there we go. Full circle. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, right, so that's that's the issue there. Uh, right. That's the issue there. Um, and so then, of course, there's also... When when David becomes king and what's normally called the covenant with David, these promises made to David about his line are really then just the expansion of what was already said in Genesis to Judah, right? Because mm. the scepter is going to come to Judah. Well, David's the one in whom it came, right? So there's this sign prophecy relationship. 
So when he comes and speaks to David, he's saying, look, you're the sign. You're, <laughs> you're here on the throne now. Right. And so reiterates the prophecy part, the promise part. Uh, and there are a couple of interesting things to note. This is recorded twice in in Second Samuel or Second Kingdom seven, and in First Chronicles or First Chronicles uh, seventeen. It's First Chronicles either way. Uh, <laughs> um, and there are some interesting things to note in both of them. When Yahweh the God of Israel is speaking to David about this, he doesn't say at the opener. Look, I have made you king. Yeah. Over my people Israel. In both 2 Samuel or 2 Kingdom 7 8 and 1 Chronicles 17 7, he says, I have made you prince. Yeah. So he's second in, com- second in command at best. <laughs> right. Bringing out this sort of iconic or sign role, this preliminary fulfillment idea. Right. Uh, and then when the promise is made, there's an interesting difference between the two records. Uh, in Second Samuel or Second Kingdom seven verse sixteen, uh, he promises David that he will establish. He says, "I will establish your house and your kingdom, meaning David's house and David's kingdom, hmm. forever." Right, right. And uh, so this this record, right, this historical book is written at the time that Israel's going into exile. Right. So this is the earlier of the two. And so it's focusing on it in this way to make the point that, hey, yes, we're going into exile. Yes, everything looks about as bad as it could get. The temple's been destroyed. But number one, we had it coming. And number two, God did make these promises about David's line. Right. So so it's not all over. Then in in First Chronicles 17, verse 14 which is written after the return from exile. When the same thing is said, God says, I will establish you in, or his descendant, David's descendant in my house and my kingdom, God's house and God's kingdom Hmm. forever. Yeah. An indication that the kingship really belongs to God. Right. But also this indicates that whoever this figure is, this ultimate king, right? David's the prince, he's the icon, he's the sign. This ultimate king is going to make David's house and kingdom and God's house and kingdom the same house and kingdom. Right, yeah, which, again, we talked about this in some detail in our episode, The Queen Stood at the Right Hand, uh, from, from, oh boy, it's almost been a year now, actually, I think, since we had that episode. Um, I don't think so. We just celebrated our one-year anniversary, so it's, I think it's, it's it has to be less than that. Almost been a year. Okay. <laughs> almost been a year. I think it was November, if I remember correctly, or early December of last year. So it's not that far. Yeah. It's it's closer to having been a year than to having not. Okay. <laughs> I guess. So, all right. Well, so having established all of that, we're going to go ahead and take uh, another break, and we'll be back with the third half of the show. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Big in Heaven, a collection of short stories available now on the Ancient Faith Bookstore. Sometimes poignant, Sometimes funny, sometimes heartbreaking, sometimes convicting. These stories of life in an inner city immigrant Orthodox parish are guaranteed to shake your assumptions and make you see your life and faith in a new way. They are not for the faint of heart, but they are very much for all who want to embrace the truth more fully. And you didn't have to ask Roscova for help. Cleaning, polishing, carrying in or out, any work in the church, the woman was a stalwart, a tovarish you could count on. No one knew her suffering. They never bothered to look into her eyes. It surprised me that most of the church folks at St. Alexander, the Whirling Dervish Parish, didn't even know her name. It wasn't anything they thought about. To find this book and others like it, 
you can go to store.ancientfaith.com. Again, that is store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome to the third and final half. That's right. We get that question a lot. Did you say third half? It's because it's a show and a half. So again, this is a reminder, though, that while we do love the voice of Steve, his own pre-recorded voice does not know that this is also a pre-recorded episode, so there are no calls being taken for this particular one on Melchizedek. So, okay, well, we're now at the final, the third half of the show, and now we're going to talk about Melchizedek's mention in Psalm 110, um, which, you know, as you've said a whole bunch of times, is the most cited uh, text from the Old Testament in the New Testament, right? Yes, is Psalm 110 or 109 in the Greek number? Yeah, right, right, right. right. Uh, in case you're looking it up in your Orthodox study Bible and you won't get confused. <laughs> um, the uh, Yeah, it is the most uh, often quoted text. And um, usually uh, when it's quoted, people don't even notice what we're going to be focusing on in this third half in that uh, it's very clearly right that the first verse is what's usually quoted. And yes. we, we've talked before about how, you know, there weren't chapter and verse divisions. Right? And so when a New Testament author quotes a line, they're quoting the first line of a passage of a section of the scriptures. And you're to understand the whole section, right? So you quote the first line of a Psalm to reference the whole Psalm. Yeah. It's basically kind of, like hypertext, essentially. Right. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and the line that everyone's heard, and the, the, probably the translation most people have heard, begins, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet, or something like that. The Lord said to my Lord. Which, of course, you know, Jesus himself quotes that, right? Right. Right. Everybody quotes that, yeah. frankly. <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. And it's and it's the, the first the Lord is, of course, Yahweh. Right. So it's it's really Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But yeah, there's so there's no psalm number for them to reference. There's no title to the song. Right. So you just you quote the first line um, and that would still work today. I mean, this show is evidence. I could quote the first line of a song and everybody automatically knows what song I'm talking about. Sure. Right. 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 Um, <laughs> that's, um, so um, that's how it's that's how it's referenced. And that first verse, right, if we don't take the time to go and look up the whole psalm or we're not reading Hebrews, uh, then that is very clearly a messianic thing. Right. That's very clearly right. Yahweh is on his throne. The Messiah sits in a throne at his right hand. Right, so this is a, a messianic thing. It has to do with the king, and he's going to defeat his enemies. Right, and and but of course, deeper into the psalm, Melchizedek shows up again. Yeah, there there are more verses to the psalm, <laughs> right. ladies and yes. gentlemen. <laughs> Melchizedek all of a sudden pops up. Right, right, right. And if you've been reading straight through the Old Testament, uh, as we've all done many <laughs> times successfully. Last, uh, last week alone, no. Right. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, you know, Melchizedek, who pops up for those three verses back in Genesis, is a distant, faded memory by the time you get to Psalm 110, right? right and he's, he's and then all of a sudden... mentioned at all. Right. Boom, Melchizedek, right? <laughs> so uh, why is he getting looped back in here uh, to this messianic tradition? I mean... You may have you may have bought it earlier in this very episode when I told you that well he's sort of an image of kingship and that's how it's connected. Uh, hopefully, several of you at least bought bought in at least that much. But now this now we're getting to as usual in the third half why we're talking about this um, that that the scriptures themselves draw Melchizedek back into this messianic picture, uh, and this psalm is is the main place they do it, and then. 
this psalm gets sort of dissected and applied in 13 different ways uh, once we get to the, the various texts that make up the New Testament. So as you mentioned, Christ quotes this verse himself, that first verse uh, himself. And one of the places where he references it is he quotes it to the Pharisees and scribes who are coming and badgering him with questions and trying to trap him. Right. Uh, so he says, I have a question for you. And so in Luke 20, verse 44, for example, he asks them, uh, you know, so this is, they all agree that this is about the Messiah. Right. So, and, and they all agree that David wrote this. Right. Right. So he says, so if it says the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and if if the Messiah is the son of David, that's one of his titles, that's who he is, how is it that David calls him his Lord? Right, which the reason why that question is a question, in case it's not obvious to people, is that in, well, I don't know, most of world history, almost everywhere, uh, no one's son is their Lord. There's always a relationship. It always goes the other direction. The, the, the son's right. Lord is his father. You know, it's, it, there's never a, you know, you've done good son. Now you're in charge of me. Like that's never a thing. Right. So that's <laughs> right. why this question is a question. How could he say that? How could David call him Lord, even though he's his, the son of David? Shouldn't David be above him? Right. Right. And so this, this is testimony that, the son of David is going to be greater than David, right? The Messiah is something bigger. But part of what Christ is doing there by pushing that rhetorical question in, in that way is, uh, is he is using an interpretation of this text that we also see in the vision of Daniel 7 that we've also talked about before uh, in the podcast, which is this scene where the Ancient of Days comes to sit on his throne and the thrones plural are set, right? Mm -hmm. And we have this sort of divine council, right? Judgment scene that takes place at Daniel. That's when the son of man comes riding on the clouds. Right. Uh, and right. the son of man is enthroned, right? Well, if the son of David, if, if the Messiah is this son of man, this heavenly son of man, well, that would make him greater than David. Yeah. Right. And we have this enthronement scene, sit at my right hand. And within Daniel seven, that's in the context of we have these beasts. Right. And and he's enthroned. And then there's this period of time before the beasts are judged. Right. So there's this there's this uh, lapse. Right. Yeah. And so in, in the second verse of Psalm one hundred and ten, that's referred to. Hmm. Right. The, the the scepter, remember that scepter from back in Genesis 49? Right, the one right, that was off, hanging you know, around a Judah. Judah, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> right. It goes out from Zion, right? Uh, goes out from Zion to extend over, to extend over the nations, right? So this is picking up that prophecy, right, that it's going to happen with this figure, but there is this element of, ruling in the midst right of his enemies and that's the that's parallel to the until i make your enemies your footstool right this is verse two of that psalm in case you're following yeah. along looking at your copy of psalm 110 slash 109 yeah <laughs> and so he is uh he is enthroned he is ruling he is ruling not only over israel but over the nations right because it's gone out from zion from jerusalem but his enemies are still out there. Right. There's this period of time, right? As we saw in Daniel 7, that's referred to as a long time, <laughs> right? After the enthronement of the Son of Man. Uh, this is the idea that was called, referred to as the Messianic Age. Right. And, and it, this is what we're in now. Right. That there's this, me once the Messiah comes, that starts this Messianic Age. And then the end of days is at the end of that. Right. And, right. And, 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 you know, th this answers the question of why it is that, do you know, despite Christ having defeated his enemies, why they are still around and messing with us. You know, and of course, we're talking about the demonic powers here. It's because this, this is part of the prophecy that he's going to rule in the midst of his enemies. He's ruling. He is ruling. But 
the enemies are still around. So, you know, think about what that means in terms of like a, a battle. You know, the, the battle can be won, but then there's a kind of rout that occurs, right? There's a retreat that's happening from, the, you know, the defeated enemies. And often they try to burn and pillage and do all kinds of mischief as they go. And that's what we're living through. That's what, the, you know, the current right. era is about. Right. And uh, this is why now I don't want to publicly shame or embarrass anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but there are still folks out there every once in a while who think that A.D. means after death, oh. that it's after Christ's death. No. Like no. B.C. is before Christ and then A.D. It's now, the big problem there would be that what would it be while well, during Christ's life? There'd be like 33 years of what D.C. during Christ? <laughs> or, um, but I'm, there, I'm not a D.C. guy. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I am. But anyway, uh, <laughs> no, Anno this Domini, is, this is the year of Anno our Lord. Domini, yeah. the year of our Lord, right? It is the year of our Lord, whatever, right? Embedded in that understanding of time is this understanding of the messianic age, right? That this is the period when Christ is ruling in the midst of his enemies. The year of our Lord, meaning the year of our Lord's rule. You start dating when the king takes his throne. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, in the Roman period, it, it, that's the way it was. You know, Tiberius VI or whatever, I don't remember how long he ruled. But I mean, that's, that's right. the way that, that ancient chronologies always went. It always reset when there was a new emperor. Right. Well, Genesis 14 that we just read, in the 14th year of, of Keterleomer. Yeah, right, exactly. Everybody's right. <laughs> yeah, except right. now it's 2021. Yeah. Uh, um, or 2024, if you. So. Uh, <laughs> I have to throw in a uh, sorry premillennialists, <laughs> right? Because it's been utterly clear to the church. It was it was utterly clear what was going to happen in Second Temple Judaism that the coming of the Messiah would start this messianic age that would then end with the end of days and the final judgment, and that there would be this intermediate period in which the Messiah would rule over the world, but his enemies would still be there. That's not another period that's still in our future. Yeah, right. The millennium. Dog don't hunt with, with the Bible, with the way Christians have always interpreted the Bible, with the way we figure out what year it is. Uh, like, uh, it, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a sorry, not sorry. I'll admit it. But, um, <laughs> so then keep it going through the psalm, right? So... It's describing this messianic age. Verse 3, right? The, the people, the people of the messianic king, offer themselves on holy mountains. Hmm. On the holy mountains. Now, this is another place where the Hebrew can be read a couple of different ways. Right. Okay. But holy mountains is the way St. Jerome reads it. And he had a cool lion for a pet. <laughs> So I'm going with him. Uh, but <laughs> if, if you understand what's going on here, right, it talks about their garments, their clean garments, right, and that they're offering themselves. Mountains make sense because these then are high places. And the idea that there are holy mountains, plural, right, mean there's been means there's been a change because remember the scepter goes out from zion from jerusalem which was the one holy mountain with the one sanctuary yeah i'm, I'm seeing like i'm seeing an alternative reading of this is uh in splendor of holiness rather than holy mountains or holy hills yeah yeah Meh. does that I, um, I, I suppose does that depend on where you put the vowel points or exactly yeah okay. yeah. yeah it's right. vowel pointing Man, those vowel points again. <laughs> <laughs> right? But in, in the context, right, we have them offering themselves, right? This is sacrificial language, right? And, and their purification of themselves and sanctification of themselves with the garments, right? Right. So it being sacrificial language, splendor of holiness doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, and then just right? the context of, like, it being sort of, like, at sunrise and then there's dew, like, this right. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so this is this idea of living sacrifices that gets picked up in the New Testament, right? But uh, so the, the people that was... Notice also it's your people. Mm. Identifying uh, the Messiah with 
with his people. The, they're, they're his people, right? Yeah. Israel is the Messiah's people. Right. Yahweh's people are the Messiah's people, right? Uh, but also this, this extension that there's going to be all over the place, right? The scepter going out from Zion in Jerusalem does not go and just crush everyone who's a Gentile, <laughs> right? It goes out there and makes a hundred other Jerusalems where people, mm. the people are gathering in holiness for, for worship. Right. Uh, during this, this messianic period. Yeah. You know, echoing of course, the thing that Christ said to the woman at the well, you know, that, that, right. You know, God's going to be worshiped in, you know, in spirit and in truth in, in every place. Well, that doesn't mean in every place. But <laughs> okay, but you know, I got. I'm actually you on okay, that. Okay, so not only in Jerusalem or on that mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The inspirited in truth is a response to is talking about the Holy Trinity. Right. Yes, that I got. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's as opposed to the other question she asks that we ignore, where he says, where Christ says, "You worship what you do not know; we worship whom we know." Uh because salvation is from the Jews. But the time will come when everyone will worship him in spirit and truth, meaning right. everyone will know God through the revelation of the Holy Trinity. Anyway, sorry. Right. Had, to, had to do it. I agree with you. Um, <laughs> That's what I meant. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so now we come to verse 4 of the psalm. Yes, yes. This is the one that actually does mention Melchizedek. Right. And here's where he pops up. And so this is important for how we understand verse 3 also. Right. Because remember, verse 3, if we understand his holy mountains, this is the sacrificial language and this worship language on all these hills, right? So verse 4, I have sworn, it's usually, I have sworn and will not repent. Yeah. Meaning not change my mind, not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a usage of repent that's a little bit older than, like, we, we tend to think yeah. of repent as meaning, like, I'm sorry for my sins, um, or some version of that, right? Which is not wrong, but, but you know, to repent means to change your mind. You know, that that's right. all it really and thus thus that's why you get some language in the scriptures of of God quote unquote repenting. It's not that God has sins that he's he has to repent of. It's it's this notion that from the point of view of the person observing this, that, that God he seems to have changed his mind. Yeah. Right. Or changed what he was going to do. He right. was threatening something, but then the person repents and so he doesn't do it. He doesn't right. do it, right. Yeah. Um he said, so he swore to repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, right? So here's where Melchizedek pops up. And uh, again, out of the blue. And, and there's this mention of the order of Melchizedek, uh, where there's no order back in Genesis. Yeah, there's just Melchizedek. Right? Melchizedek doesn't show up with like a bunch of followers or a school or, right? Um, so order here shouldn't be translated too literally. We tend to think of order like an order of monks or an order, yeah. right? The, yeah, the, the net has it is after the pattern of Melchizedek. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. There's the order, organization, the style, the type, the pattern, the the genus. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're the um, kind that he was. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um. So so there's there's a a superficial right level at which we can we can immediately understand this well. This is saying that, and this is this is part of. We're going to go into more depth, but this is the beginning. Uh, not only is he a is he a king, right? But he's also a priest, and specifically, he's serving as a sort of high priest, hmm. right? That so he is in Zion. His scepter has gone out from there, and so he is sort of serving as the high priest over the people who are offering their worship in all of these scattered places, right? That it's sort of being taken up by him as high priest, right? In addition to being king. And so since he is both king and high priest, that's like Melchizedek, who is both priest and king in Zion, right? So that that's our first sort of superficial level. So it's sort of like, oh, yeah, like that guy was, right? Which is um, true. It is right. true, yes. <laughs> Right. But so noting this now, uh, especially in St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews, he's going to go deeper, right? So, I mean, you can see right away where he, he's going to get the, the language of Christ as the great high priest from this, right? How you get the Messiah and the high priest together, right? Um, 
But also, uh, he's going to make a contrast between uh, the priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Yeah. Yeah, what's that right. all about? Right. Well, part of it is that, as he says, uh, Christ is not a Levite. Mm. Right. Um, so he would not be eligible to be part of the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, and so uh, he says, no, right? Christ is in this, when he's Christ's high priest, he's, he's the high priest in this, this other priesthood. Uh, but also, this is where he talks about, and this is where, as you were talking about, where some people want to say Melchizedek is the, the quote-unquote pre-incarnate. That's problematic, but <laughs> Christ, right, in 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 Genesis, they're, they're taking this a little too literally. So he makes some comparisons between Melchizedek and Christ, right, in that Melchizedek kind of shows up out of nowhere. There's no genealogy of Melchizedek. right. Right. And he kind of disappears into nowhere. So his priesthood is in a certain way kind of eternal, not in that it literally was, but in the sense that we're not told when it began and when it ended. Right. Right. It's, he's not enclosed within the text. The story, there is no story of Melchizedek, right? Um, and in the same way, Christ's priesthood is not sort of limited and bounded the way Aaron's was. Hmm. And the ironic line was, and we talked before in a previous episode, we were talking about sacrifice, about how priesthood was separated, was taken away from leadership and, and kingship within Israel. Right. It's uh, split. Yeah. Which was sort of a, a further limitation. And so the priesthood of Melchizedek is, is in the understanding of St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews is understood to be this kind of limitless and eternal priesthood. Hmm. Right of which the erotic priesthood was sort of a shadow, uh, or or icon is too firm. It's even more shadowy than that. Um, Melchizedek would be the the icon in this case. Um, so it's this this eternal, unending priesthood, and it is for Hebrews a a priesthood that is carried out not in an earthly sanctuary but in the heavenly sanctuary. Right, and so this is another place where our understanding of the Messiah, if we understand that the Messiah is going to be the Son of Man, the 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 uh, heavenly Son of Man from Daniel seven, right? The heavenly Son of Man does what in Daniel seven? He's enthroned in the heavenly places, and he, as God's Son, God the Father's Son, Yahweh the Son, presides over. The divine council, right? So that the kingship right. that the 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 Melchizedek messianic priest has is a kingship that's not bound. It's not you know limited to earth. It's it's actually the kingship, the presidency over you know the highest possible court that can can be the court truly of of the heavens, right? And and we've talked about when we've talked about. Uh, Theosis, when we've talked about sainthood, we've talked about that primarily from the king side in the past on this show. Right. Uh, that that you know Christ is the king, and then he has his royal court, <laughs> right? And the divine council is like his royal court through which he administers, right? Who he shares out of love, he shares his administration of the creation with them. But there is also remember this priestly aspect that we haven't talked about as much yeah. that we're going to talk about a little more now where remember as is reiterated in St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, when the tabernacle is constructed, it's constructed after the pattern of what Moses saw on the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. He ascends the mountain and goes into the divine council and he's there uh, right with Yahweh speaking face to face with him, with the angelic beings. Right, the law is given through angels, um, and he then creates the tabernacle, the place where the priests serve. Yeah, right. And this as is the image. As I was saying, and this is reflected. I mean, we just you know, so we're recording this on the feast of the uh, exaltation of the cross on our calendar. Um, that's where we're speaking to you from. Um, so this morning, you know, we just celebrated liturgy for the feast, and um, 
like this kind of thing is reflected all over the divine liturgy. But I just thought uh, just now, for instance, about the prayer that gets said right before what's called the little entrance, which in the in the ancient church would have been the point at which the clergy and the people are really entering into the church. Um, it's not. It wouldn't at the time. It would not have just been the clergy kind of leaving the altar area and then coming back into it real quick. It was really their first entrance into it. And that prayer explicitly asks God to make that entrance be accompanied by angels, right? And there's all kinds of references then in the Divine Liturgy to angels serving alongside the celebrant who's there, right? So so like you said, there's this image of, of you know the, the royal court and the king on his throne and so forth. But at the same time, this is the priest. Christ is the priest, and the angelic beings serve alongside him the way that deacons and altar servers do. You know, and, and indeed that their vestments, those servers' vestments are designed to remind one of, of angels, right? That you know, this is all going on there. We still need to do episodes on the divine liturgy. We have to, um, but but you know that this is all going on there as well. Um, and, and it's and it is you know mystically speaking, it is the same thing. Both are really the same thing. These are just kind of two different angles of of talking about it, and two different images that are given in scripture of it. Right, and and they they overlap and they're drawn together. You know, in in Saint John's Apocalypse. Right, and we've quoted this before when we were talking about the saints. Right, he says that in the first resurrection they'll come alive and reign with him during this period, and that they will be priests. Yeah, right. Those two things go together. Right, right, and and Christ as the second person of the Holy Trinity, the second person of Yahweh, the God of Israel, presiding over the council, also means that he is the high priest who is leading the worship of that council because that's what they do. And he is the great high priest because he is God and man can both worship, lead worship and receive worship mm. validly. Unlike the pagan priest Kings and God Kings right. of Abraham's day. Yeah. I mean that he is the only one that can do that. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, you know, is justifiably able to do it. Right. The rest Anyone else who you, does is an antichrist. Right, right. The rest in the most you, literal sense. Usurpers in, in one way or another. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that is the picture we're getting from verse 3 and 4 of the Psalm uh, of of Psalm 110 is this image of earthly and heavenly worship being united in the figure of the messianic king who is also a priest like Melchizedek. Right. Right. During this messianic age. And so the primary thing from the perspective of the psalm, right, from, from David's prophetic vision, the primary thing that characterizes the messianic era between now and the end is the worship of the liturgy, mm. right? That's, that's the character of this age. Uh, and then outside of that, there are the enemies. And so in verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 110, we get the final destruction of those enemies, Right, the the demonic kings and chiefs of the nations. Yeah, he executes right. judgment against the nations. Uh, that's how it, yeah. how it begins. Yeah. yeah, and and smashes their kings and their chiefs, um, and so those enemies are finally done away with. And then in verse seven, we have this image of him stooping and drinking out of a brook. And the idea there is to it's a pastoral scene of peace, this final era of perfect peace with the enemies gone. Mm. Uh, within the creation. So Psalm 110 is quoted more than anything else, obviously because it gives this important <laughs> right, span, this important uh, uh, prophetic layout of, of what's to come. And then once Christ comes, the, the New Testament authors are then saying, this is what's now arrived. Hmm. And so they go back to it again and again to characterize the age that's now begun. So over the course of this episode, we've sort of pulled a whole bunch of things together from all over the Old Testament based on how they're used in the New Testament and different things. And we've even pulled in some things from the last episode from Abraham and Isaac. Uh, and a lot of times uh, Christians get accused, especially by uh, some of our Jewish friends, rabbinic Jewish friends, 
and even sometimes by non-religious people that we just kind of go to the scriptures, especially the Hebrew scriptures, and just kind of pillage them <laughs> for stuff that sounds uh, a little bit Christ-like, <laughs> right? And so, you know, Nietzsche said any stick of wood that shows up in the scriptures automatically becomes the cross. Yes. Um, and, <laughs> right? And, and like we're just kind of, you know, playing fast and loose, right? And kind of constructing Christian theology, this sort of foreign edifice to it, right? Um and that you, we're, we're only doing that sort of a posteriori, right? We've received this Christian religion, and so we're now going back and looking for evidence of it in the Old Testament. And lo and behold, when that's what you're looking for, you find it. Right. Right? So to counter that, <laughs> here at the end of our third half, uh, I would like to offer an ancient text, um, which is... Uh, called 11 Q 13 rolls off your tongue. <laughs> it's Sounds title. like somebody's non-personalized <laughs> license plate. Um, <laughs> this is one of the dead sea scrolls. Okay. Uh, so the way the dead sea scrolls are labeled is the first number is which cave they came out of. Right. Right. So 11 Q 13 came out of cave 11. The Q is for Qumran, which is the place where the dead sea scrolls were discovered. And then the second number is just the order in which they found and identified them. <laughs> right? So this is uh, 11Q13. It's sometimes called the Melchizedek document or the coming of Melchizedek. Uh, this text was written around 100 BC. So okay. this is 100 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, by this incredibly fundamentalist Jewish group <laughs> right? um, that's living out in the desert because they thought the Pharisees were too liberal. And this is actually their exegesis of the commandment about the Jubilee year in Leviticus 25. Yeah, right. So if you look at Leviticus 25, what gets commanded there is it's called the year of Jubilee. And it's basically this sort of big economic reset. Like all the debts are are forgiven, all the captives released. Everyone has to go back. You know, everyone gets the land back that belonged to their forefathers. Right. Slaves are freed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I mean, it's it's. Um, I mean, we could have a whole episode about the jubilee, <laughs> but um, <laughs> and we may. Yeah, we should. Yeah, it's a good. It's a great idea. Um, but that's the context. Um, right. So you know, if you haven't read Leviticus twenty-five, okay, welcome back. Uh, so, but yeah, this, this, as you said, this, yeah. this text is, this text is about that. This is their sort of commentary on that. Um, so I'm going to read it to you, to everybody. And I'll, I'll just, you know, there are, um, it's fragmentary. So there's bits where the manuscript got damaged. Okay. So where, where that happened, I'm going to, I'm going to say dot, 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 just so you know that there's a break in what I'm saying. Um, and then also, you know, it quotes, a number of places in the Old Testament. So when it does quote it, then I'm just going to mention what that reference is. Okay, so as, as I read it here. Okay, so it's a little long, but please just, just, just bear with me. So listen to this. And concerning what the Scripture says, in this year of Jubilee you shall return, every one of you, to your possession. Leviticus 25, 13. And what is also written... And this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exacting it of a neighbor who is a member of the community because God's remission has been proclaimed. Deuteronomy 15.2 The interpretation is that it applies to the last days and concerns the captives. Just as Isaiah said, to proclaim the jubilee to the captives. Isaiah 61.1 Dot, dot, dot just as dot 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 and from the inheritance of Melchizedek for dot 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 Melchizedek who will return them to what is rightfully theirs he will proclaim to them the jubilee thereby releasing them from the debt of all their sins dot 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 then the day of atonement shall follow after the 10th jubilee period when he shall atone for all the sons of light and the people who are chosen for Melchizedek, dot, 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 upon them, dot, 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 
For this is the time decreed for the year of Melchizedek's favor. And by his might, he will judge God's holy ones and so establish a righteous kingdom. As it is written about him in the songs of David, a God has taken his place in the council of gods. In the midst of gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 82, 1. Scripture also says about him, over it, take your seat in the highest heaven. A God will judge the peoples. Psalm 7, 7 through 8. Concerning what Scripture says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality with the wicked? Psalm 82, 2. The interpretation applies to Belial and the spirits chosen for him, because all of them have rebelled, turning from God's precepts and so becoming utterly wicked. Therefore, Melchizedek, will thoroughly prosecute the vengeance required by God's statutes. Also, he will deliver all the captives from the power of Belial and from the power of all the spirits chosen for him. Allied with him will be all the righteous gods, Isaiah 61, 3, dot, dot, dot. The visitation is the day of salvation that he has decreed through Isaiah the prophet concerning all the captives, inasmuch as scripture says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, Isaiah 52, 7. This scripture's interpretation, the mountains are the prophets, they who were sent to proclaim God's truth and to prophesy to all Israel. The messengers is the anointed of the spirit of whom Daniel spoke. After 62 weeks, an anointed shall be cut off, Daniel 9, 26. The messenger who brings good news, who announces salvation, is the one of whom it is written, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, Isaiah 61, 2. The scripture's interpretation, he is to instruct them about all the periods of history for eternity and in the statutes of the truth, and then dot, 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 dominion, that passes from Belial and returns to the sons of light, light dot, 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 by the judgment of God, just as it is written concerning him, who says to Zion, your God reigns, Isaiah 52, 7. Zion is the congregation of all the sons of righteousness who uphold the covenant and turn from walking in the way of the people. Your God is Melchizedek, who would deliver them from the power of Belial. Concerning what scripture says, then you shall have the trumpet sounded loud in the seventh month, Leviticus 25, 9. I, before you go into you know, talking yeah. about this, I, I just wanted to mention something that I noticed as I was reading it, which I kind of loved. Um, you know, there is this interpretation out there of Psalm 82 saying that this council, this divine council that God stands up in the midst of is really just human rulers or the rulers of the people of Israel. And I just wanted to point out that here is this, this uh, you know, Judean text from 100 years before the birth of Christ that explicitly says that this is about God judging the demon Belial and those who are allied to him. I just wanted to point that out. This Second Temple Jewish uh, text explicitly says that this is about God judging the fallen, you know, the fallen angels. So just wanted to point that out. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. That that the 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 what we would call the quote unquote literal interpretation. Uh, the the fact that every fifty years they were supposed to release their slaves and forgive their debts. That's like the sign. Yeah. Right. Of of the real prophecy, which this is saying is about this figure they're calling Melchizedek coming, who right. is both the anointed one who gets cut off. You may have noticed. And, and <laughs> right. called your God. Like that's the last thing it says. That 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 line, your God, is is, yes. is Melchizedek. Is the Melchizedek now again, it's, it's this <laughs> figure they're calling Melchizedek. Right? That you know right. we're not saying this means that the the man whom Abram met is going to come back and do these things. The, right. the, no. po the point is like when it's said that David is going to do X, Y, and Z, they don't mean King David. The point is that there is this figure who in himself is, the, is you know, what David is in his fullness, that this figure right. is Melchizedek in his fullness. Right. right. Melchizedek is the pattern. Yes. Remember the order, right? The 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 sign right, right. and so right. yes and so this is messiah divine messiah who stands in the council of the gods renders judgment against belial frees the people from their sins remits their debts 
right? All the language we've been talking about today is all drawn together here, plus stuff we've talked about in the past, as you just pointed out, right? This was all being drawn together and understood 100 BC. Right. Right. And so the New Testament authors are not making anything up, right? Christianity is a continuation of this religion that already existed when Christ came, right? But it's now shifted to, now we know who that person is, who Melchizedek was the pattern of, and it's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing that's changed is that what was prophesied to happen has now happened. We've now moved into this new phase, into this into this new period. So it's not us a posteriori coming back and pulling all these things together. This was all pulled together beforehand. This is how the scriptures were understood. Right. By the people who took it seriously and studied it and, and were reading uh, the. uh the Hebrew scriptures at, at the time, Mm. nothing new, very old. Indeed. Well, to wrap up this episode, uh, about Melchizedek, the thought that I had that, that to me ties it all together is, you know, it's, it's often the case that a lot of the things that we discuss that people could take a superficial, uh, image of them and kind of walk away and, and think, okay, you know, a lot of this stuff is a kind of bestiary, right? Like it's it's a collection of, of weird and mysterious and strange things you find in the Bible, you know, and 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 have this kind of antiquarian, exotic, you know, feeling about this stuff. And of course, you know, Melchizedek is one of these kinds of figures. Like, whoa, who is this guy? I mean, this is really strange and mysterious, right? Um, you know, of course, you know, we we talk about giants and angels and demons and the various names of of fallen angels, um, and I think that it can be possible for some people to, um, you know, as the cliche goes, to miss the forest for the trees, meaning that we can get really caught up in looking at individual figures or stories or whatever it might be, which are, I mean, cool, you know, like this is really interesting, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, but if, if it's not finally all being referred back to Christ, then, then we're not only wasting our time, we actually might be harming ourselves. Um, you know, the, the Bible is not a collection of ancient texts that you can find weird, cool, mysterious things in. I mean, that's, that's probably literally true on some level, but that's not its point, right? It's not a kind of book of magic spells, um, it's, it's not, um, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's not a collection of curiosities and, and things to just sort of titillate the mind, right? It all points towards Christ. And to me, this episode is one of the ones that, I mean, I think we, God willing, we're doing this in every episode, but, uh, I love where the, the, the last part where we ended on with this, this text from hundred BC from the Qumran community, um, talking about, Melchizedek as being this messianic, kingly, savior figure, right, who's proclaiming release to the captives and, and rescuing his people from, uh, from demons, and, and how it's like, whoa, that is so Christian, right? It's so clearly Christian, and yet this is 100 years before anyone was, or 130 years before anyone was being called a Christian, right? That was not even a, a, a term uh, at, at this period. Um, it's clearly about Christ. You don't even have to, you don't have to stretch it at all to see Christ in that. Um, this is, this is about him. And that's the goal of everything that we're doing on this podcast is to direct people to Jesus Christ, to direct them to worshiping him, to direct them to being faithful to him, to direct them to knowing him better. Right, and I think this particular topic we discussed on this episode is especially about that latter bit. It's about knowing Christ better. Uh, when when people say, you know, I look at the Old Testament or and I see Christ everywhere, that's not a stretch. It's not a stretch. That's reality. And so we've looked at one figure from the Old Testament, this image of Melchizedek, who, you know, as far as we know, 
it's a real person. Abram meets him. Uh, but he also in himself, just as David does, he in himself is uh, an icon of the one who is to come, the one who is the prophet, the priest, the king, the messiah, the savior, the rescuer of captives, the messenger proclaiming the good news, the defeater of the demons. He's an image of, of all of that, as we heard summarized in this um, this text from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, it all all points to Jesus Christ. That's where we should always end up in every single journey that we take. Father? Yeah, so building off that a little, um, one of the most basic questions when you start studying the scriptures seriously is uh, essentially whether the Bible is a thing. And what I mean by that is, um, obviously, the, the, we, of course, buy a Bible and it's a book, right? But in actuality, it's a collection of texts across centuries, you know, millennia virtually, um, that have been touched by countless hands, different authors, right? And especially when you take into account the fact that uh, modern scholarship, you know, our 19th century German friends have done everything possible to try to make not just every book of the Bible, but every piece of every book of the Bible look as disparate from every other piece as possible. Uh, whether this collection we have uh, actually constitutes anything, whether it's just put together by habit, whether it's just put together by historical accident, uh, whether there's anything connecting it other than those series of historical accidents. Uh, and uh, I think this is a place of, of differentiation that you can clearly see between uh, the Christian understanding of Scripture and the rabbinic Jewish understanding of Scripture. Because on the Christian side, uh, once you delve deep into the Scriptures, and I hope this is what comes out on this show, this is the thing that in 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 this show, in this podcast, in, in the Bible studies I do, the thing I most want to try to bring people in touch with is the fact that once you start digging into the scriptures even a little bit, you start to see that there is this, there are these structures that lie beneath the scriptures that connect the texts to each other, the different parts of a text to each other, that connect the whole, there are ideas, there are realities that the text is an expression of and trying to draw those out. And the interesting thing coming at it as an Orthodox Christian is that it doesn't even really matter what canon of the Old Testament you use. Whether you're using the, the Hebrew Bible canon, the the usual Greek collection, usual Slavonic collection, you can go get yourself an Ethiopian Old Testament right? With, with the extra dozen books. Any of those you take, you will find the same structure, the same themes. You will find the whole thing and all of its parts when you see the links and tie them together all pointing toward the one person of Jesus Christ. You can include or exclude First Enoch, you still get the same Christ. You can include or exclude Third Maccabees, you still get the same Christ. It fits. We don't have to go back and cut out pieces of the tradition we've received from our forefathers of the faith. I'm talking about the ones before the coming of Christ. We don't have to go and weed out pieces of that tradition in order to make ours hang together. I don't think you can say that about the rabbinic Jewish view of the Old Testament. I don't think there is a logical internal reason why Ecclesiastes is in and Tobit is out. I don't see any cogent reason for most of those decisions. 
other than other than uh, to obscure as much as possible those links and structures and themes that I was just talking about. When we let the tradition we've received since Abraham, right? When we let that speak for itself, all of it orients us toward the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? All of it orients us toward that. All of it orients us toward who Christ is and what he will do. All of it gives us the same picture of who Christ is and what he will do. All of it gives us the same picture of how we find our salvation, right? So it becomes a unit sort of in and of itself. And, and uh, that to me is the greatest argument, not only for the fact that the Bible is a thing, that the scriptures are a thing, that they are a cohesive whole, but also that they're a cohesive whole with the whole rest of the, the, the Orthodox faith, which also speaks with that same voice, same voice that the apostles spoke with, the same voice that Second Temple Jewish teachers spoke with, the same voice that the teachers of ancient Israel who were faithful spoke with, the same understanding that Abraham had and that Isaac had and that Jacob had and that David had and Saints Peter and Paul had. Uh, the fact that we find it in the scriptures, regardless of our Christian tradition, we find it in our liturgy, regardless of our ancient Christian tradition, right? shows us that this is not just a construct. This is not just something we built over time, but this is an expression of a deep and eternal reality. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to focus on here at the end. That's our show for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. This was not a live broadcast, but we would still nonetheless love to hear from you either via email at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com or you can message us at our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page. We do read everything, but don't respond, but can't respond to everything. It's true, we don't respond. We can't respond to everything. And we do save what you send for possible use in future episodes. Some of those things I just don't respond to. <laughs> Join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. If you're on Facebook, you can like our Facebook page, join our discussion group, leave reviews and ratings everywhere, but most importantly, share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it or, you know, one that's going to hate it. Yeah, one that's going to claim I'm a pagan all over the internet. <laughs> and finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com stroke support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. And buy my new book, Arise, O God, and also make sure you pick up Father Stephen's book, Religion of the Apostles. You can get both at store.ancientfaith.com. Thank you, good night, and God bless you. You've been listening to The Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. 